Thank you. Um, my name is Carlos Gonzalez. I work at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, and today I will show you part of our research in modeling the possible effect of climate change on productivity of thorn pine forests. As a brief outline of my presentation, first I will introduce you into the southern pine forest in the southeast United States. Then I will show you briefly the model that we are using to address the climate change impacts on our southern pine stand. It's, the model is called 3PG. Then I will show you some examples of the parameterization process that we did to, to be a, a, a able to use the model for, for one of these species. I will show you the, 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 the example of slash pine, one of the important species, commercial species in the, in the Southeast United States. Then I will show you some examples of the model validation. And finally, we are going to try to address this question about the impact of climate change in the productivity of the forest. Well, uh, forests uh, have multiple garden services, wildlife habitat, you know, water, soil, um, carbon sequestration, and of course, wood production. The Southeast United States, in the Southeast United States, 60% of the landscape is forested including about 28 million of southern pine forests. The southeast United States produces 58% of the total harvest production of round wood in the country, and that corresponds to about 18% of the global supply of round wood. So the southeast United States produces more round wood than any other country in the world. The Saudi, uh, southeastern pine forests contain about one-third of the contiguous uh, forest carbon in the United States and have the potential to sequester about 23% of the regional greenhouse gases emissions. Well, the most important species in, uh, uh, are pine species, are lovely pine, slush pine, and longleaf pine. Today, I will show you our research in slush pine. We are also working with the other species. Well, that is a typical image of a slush pine plantation. Uh, that is at about 15-year-old stand, and at the right we have the, the distribution of the species in the southeast United States. Uh, the, the range of distribution is, is very wide from South Carolina to Louisiana, covering Georgia and an um, important part of um, Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi. So this species is a medium to long-lived species. It's a fast-growing species. It's, the, it's an important commercial species in the, Saudi, in the Saudi United States, the second most important species. And the objective of the plantations are pulpwood and salt timber production. The area of timberland is about 4.2 million hectares. The model that we are using to uh, predict productivity it's called 3PG. It has three Ps, Pro physiological principles predicting. And the G is the growth of the forests. That uh, model was uh, first published in, in 1997 by Joe Lansford and Dick Waring. And they published in a journal called Forest Ecology and Management. It's one of the most important journals in forestry. And has more than 1,000 refer uh, been referenced more than 1,000 times. Is the most cited article in the history of that journal. And this model has been applied in many countries: in Australia, New Zealand, in Chile, in Brazil, in South Africa, in China, and it's, it's used for uh, research purposes, academic purposes, but also for industrial purposes. 
some companies use the model to update the inventories. The, the, the good part of the model is very simple to use. You just need very simple weather data. Monthly, uh, mean minimum temperature, mean maximum temperature. Um, you need radiation, rainfall. And if you have vapor pressure deficit, a number of rainy days is better, but the model can calculate that. So the model is based in, in, in three main uh, principles, light interception, carbon acquisition, and carbon allocation. So this is a, a diagram of the model. From the sun, we have the energy uh, and using the light use efficiency or the quantum yield of our species, including the leaf area index of the stand, the, the model calculates the, the GPP or gross primary producti productivity. Uh, there is some, an important loss of that photosynthesis in respiration. So uh, the model estimates net primary productivity after discounting the, the respiration. That net primary productivity, or NPP, it's allocated to the different components of the, of the trees, to roots, foliage, and stems. And the allocation factors are affected by some weather conditions and also by the development of the stand. Okay? This is the basal area of the stand. As the stand is developing, the, the, the allocation ratios are changing. The model also um, use a, has a, a sub-model that accounts for mortality, okay? There is a mortality that is stochastic, that is not density dependent, but there is also a mortality of the trees because of competition. And that, the, those processes are accounted by, by, the, by the model. Here we have a, a, a water balance submodule. So um, the rainfall is the input, and the model calculates a soil water balance uh, after accounting for evapotranspiration and use canopy conductance to, to drive uh, the, am the amount of evapotranspiration. And canopy conductance is calculated from leaf area index and some environmental parameters that reduce that or affect that canopy conductance. There are some er environmental factors, in this case temperature. Uh, this is the fertility, the nutrition of the sun, the vapor pressure deficit that affects the light use efficiency and also uh, affects the, as I told you, the, the allocation and also the, the water balance. So that Q is the in incoming radiation, it's global radiation. It's transformed to PAR radiation and using the leaf area index of the stand, that total incoming radiation is transformed to intercept the radiation. Using our canopy, uh, canopy yield or can, uh, quantum yield factor uh, that is not constant actually, uh, we calculate GPP, but if we discount the respiration, we estimate the net primary productivity. But that quantum yield is not constant because it's affected by, by several factors temperature, frost, nutrition, vapor pressure deficit, available for water, the age, and CO2 concentration. So there is a maximum canopy quantum yield. It's a theoretical, it's a maximum possible, but the plants or the trees never can achieve that value. And all those, are, those modifiers are values between zero and one. This is an example of how we got the the, the parameters for, in this case, the, the, the modifier factor for vapor pressure deficit, and also how we calculate the, the maximum canopy quantum yield. Using AD covariance tower information that those are instruments that are uh, installed on, on the top of the canopy of the stand, uh, they measure uh, gas exchange in real time, 10 times per second, actually. It's a, and they use an ultrasonic anemometer to account for the changes in that, in that um, so for the direction of those changes in CO2 concentration. So during the night, uh, we can estimate the respiration because there is an increase in CO2 concentration. And during the day, 
the CO2 is, is taken by the, by the trees and there is a reduction in the CO2 concentration. So this is an example, 10 years of measurements, two sites, and we were able to, to estimate what is the sensitivity of the canopy conductance to changes in vapor pressure deficit. At the right side, we have the, an example of two sites, 10 years of measurements on, on each site, and we were able to estimate that parameter, the canopy quantum yield, is about 0 0.056 for this space, moles of CO2 per mole of power radiation. Other modifiers, temperature, uh, other researchers uh, did the, 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 the investigation on that and they, they obtained which were the minimum, optimum, and maximum temperatures where the, the plants are doing uh, photosynthesis. Uh, similar, the, the model used uh, relationship between um, the, the impact on canopy conductance due to changes in, in available salt water. In this case, they are in relative term, relative available salt water, and the relative modifier, because it's between zero and one. So for, di for different soil textures, there are different modifiers. And this is, a, this is in preparation, it's, it's a brand new information. Using a phase study, um, they, in, in Duke Forest in North Carolina, they installed these huge giant rings, towers, circle, where they feed the plot with CO2, increasing the concentration up to 500 or 700 parts per million for 10 years. What's it? Millions and millions of dollars to estimate that curve. <laughs> they did many other things, but so estimate that. What is the impact of CO2 increase into many physiological processes of the trees, okay? And um, Bob Teske from the University of Georgia, the, using that information, he gave me the parameters for the response uh, in, in canopy quantum yield due to increase in, in, in CO2 concentration. There are many other parameters that I don't have the time to show you guys. The allocation, the canopy closure, dynamics, mortality, the um, allometry, but if you are interested, you can go in there. Just two months ago, we, we published the, the manuscript at Forest Ecology and Management. But we did the validation on 14 sites in the United States. The location of the sites are the different figures in this map. The, the gray zone is the natural distribution of the species. We have some sites outside of the natural distribution, some in Texas. And, and also we have seven sites in Uruguay because the, mod the model should work anywhere. Anywhere where the, the, the species is working, the model should work. We try to get information from China because we know there are plantations in China and other countries, but we are not able. Anyway, we have about 118 permanent plots. And those permanent plots were measured several times. In total, we have almost 700 year by plot observations that we use for validation. Um, and this figure shows examples of some of the outputs of the model in, in our validation. In all the cases, the x-axis is the observed value, the y-axis is the predicted value. Uh, on the panel A, we have the above ground biomass. So there is a very good agreement between observed and predicted value. For all those sites, different age, different productivity, uh, some in Uruguay, some in Texas, some in Georgia, in Georgia, United States. And uh, that is the example of, of the validation for the, the, the mean height of the stand, very good agreement. The basal area, the basal area is an index of productivity and stocking used by the foresters. That is the projection of the cross-section area at, an, at the breast height. The mortality, also the model did pretty good. And in total volume, that is very important for forest production. So in general, the bias, in, in this is in percentage, was smaller than 7%. And the R square were up larger than 90.9. So, oh, okay. So, 
Okay, so our case study, we use uh, climate data from that model and using a done scale method called MACA. Okay, you can, you can go there and you can uh, get for free that information. So we used three climate change scenarios. One, historical, nothing happens, is using the average values between 1950 and 2010. So we run the model for that scenario, assuming the current CO2 concentration that is about 400 parts per million. And we also use two RCPs scenarios. Uh, ICPP develops several climate change scenarios that, uh, based on CO2 emissions. So we took two, the RCP 4.5 and the RCP 8.5. In that case, we use, we have monthly uh, data for each validation, for each site that we are using for, for running the model. Uh, and we assume that for, for the RCP 4.5, the, the CO2 concentration is, the average is 550 parts per million, and for the other scenarios, 850. We also run the model for three different productivity scenarios, low, medium, and high productivity. Give me one minute. Okay, that is the location of the sites. Uh, the white figures represent the site where we are run, running the model that in the, in the northern distribution of the species. And, and the, this figure, the, the, the blue numbers, are the mean annual temperature, okay? The, that map shows the different colors, different mean annual net temperature. So in the south of, of Florida, it's warmer. In the north, it's, get, it's getting colder. There is one degree difference in each color. And uh, in, in general, you can see the, the increase, the change, the average change in the future due to the different uh, climate change scenarios. So in some cases, we have increment between two and three degrees Celsius in the northern part, but in the southern, th th that increment will be a little bit smaller. So in average, we have, we expected increases in between 1.8 to three uh, degrees Celsius for the 4.5 and for the other scenarios, increment between 2.6 and 4.8. The, the rainfall is a little bit variable, but the, the expected change for that region is about between plus minus 5%, same for radiation, but it's a little bit lower, the, the, the variability. This is an example of the model behavior. Uh, the model, you can estimate many parameters, water use efficiency, NPP. In this case, I'm showing you leaf area index dynamics for each color represent uh, the different productivity that we are running the model, and within each productivity, we have different figures that represent the different climate change scenarios. So, in general, in, in the in the lower part or the, in the warmer region, um, the for the low productivity, it's expected. An, in, an increase in productivity or in the biomass at age 25 between 10 and 20 tons per hectare for the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 respectively. And that increment and that increase due in productivity due to climate change is increasing as we move north. In the northern part, the increment will be larger. In part because the natural productivity is lower on those sites because they, where they are in the, in the extremes of low temperatures for that species. As an average, for the site with mi uh, mean temperatures lower than 19 degrees, we will expect a larger increment in productivity. And that increment in productivity will be larger in the low productivity site, similar to a response to fertilization. You expect more response to fertilization where your, your natural productivity is lower. And that response will be larger for the RCP 8.5. So conclusions, uh, on warmer sites, in average, we expect an increment of about 8% in the productivity. And, and for the RCP 4.5 and for the other scenario, will be larger, about 13%. But the range of variab variation is, is large. And for the, for the cooler sites in the northern distribution, we expect larger effect or increment in productivity, about 17% for one scenario and 27% for the other scenario. I think I'm done. Big tech message. The response to climate change should be larger 
in colder range of distribution, and the response to climate change should be larger in low productivity sites. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, we have got time for one short question. Hi, Carlos. Uh, nice talk, thank you. Um, the, the, the model is named after physiological principles predict growth. So, so how does the model integrate like land management effect? You, uh, the model, you can change the planting density, changing the thinning regimes. You can do thinning, and so the model is sensitive to that. You have to set the year of thinning and the, and the intensity of that thinning. Um, if you are irrigating, that is very unlikely, but the model, it's like another input in your water balance, so you have to put the amount of irrigation that you are adding. And you also can, the model can account for fertilization, changing the, 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 the a nutritional status parameter. So, but it's the most important uh, management are the thinnings and the planting density and the model, it's flexible for that. <laughs>